1 John chapter number 2. Boy, we throw this word around in society. It's the word love. Love. It's just, it's just a good word to say. Say it with me now. Love. See, you can't just say it, love. You got to go like, love. It's a good word. We use it for all sorts of things. Boy, I love my wife. It's good context, right? I don't want you to love her. I love her. In fact, in my, in my list of personal goals and priorities, love for God is first and love for my wife is number two. All right, love for my children, family number three, and this church is number four. You say, was oh, that right? Well, read your Bible. You'll find that, that it's right. All right, I got to love God more than anything else, anyone else. And then my wife, I only have one, one wife, the good Lord willing, and uh, boy, she puts up with me, so I ought to do something for her, and I can love her. And uh, we use that word love for our wife, and that's wonderful in a, in a relationship. I love the person. I love my children. Great. I love food. Now, why did that get a bigger amen than say I love my wife? That's how society works, isn't it? You say, I love food, and I could be a little more uh, descriptive. I could say, I love steak. Get some amens. I love cheesecake. I love apple pie. I love Thanksgiving. I love dinner. Is it time for dinner yet? Um, I love all those things. We, we throw that around. I love Cedar Point. Sporadic loves. I love a Chevy. Oh, decisive. Amens. I love my soft bed and my wonderful pillow. I can't stand hotels. We use this word love all over the place, not really contemplating or using it probably in its proper context. It's often used as a I like or I prefer kind of context. When we come to this passage in 1 John chapter number 2, John is going to bring this word love and our regard towards something. When he brings us this word love, he's not just talking about a slight little preference or a, a little ooey gooey feeling. He's trying to get a point across to us in 1 John chapter number 2. And we're going to read our passage, if you would please, um, beginning in verse number 15. And John writes now, he finished last week, the encouragement to continue where he says, Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, for all that is in the world, for how much? All that is in the world. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. When it says there abideth, again, help but reference back to chapter number one where he talks about fellowship. When you walk with God, you abide with God. I can't help but think of John, I believe it's chapter number 15, where Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, abide in me. And he says, if you, if you do these things, the will of God, you'll abide with him forever. That means on this life and the life hereafter. See, the question tonight is this, do I have love for God in my heart? This is a test of God's love, kind of like a diagnostic test. Sometimes in your car on the dashboard, a little light will come on, and you can go down to the, to the mechanic and to the auto shop, and they can plug a little computer into your car, and it'll give you a, a diagnostic readout of what is wrong with your car. It may be a small sensor that you probably wouldn't have found short of this diagnostic test. If you're not feeling well, you can go to the doctor. They can take your blood, and they can run a series of diagnostic tests uh, test on your blood. And they can tell you that, that, that there is something wrong with you or, 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 and why you feel this way. You see, John tonight gives us this diagnostic test, uh, and it's love for God versus love for the world. You have to understand, though, I think, beginning, what this actually means. Because the Bible says, John says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I think it's important to understand, first of all, that it can't mean that God doesn't love me. Right, it cannot mean that God does not love me. Why? Because 
God's love for me is not based on what I do. It's based on who he is. We love him because he first loved us. That verse is found in 1 John later on. So when it says, if I love the world, that, I, that the love of the Father is not in me, it does not mean that all of a sudden I have now removed myself from the love of God. Right? That is important to understand because that thought will come into our minds. My, my life is not going well, so it must be that, that I'm having some error in my life. And it must be that I'm not spending enough time in my devotions or praying hard enough because if I prayed more and if I read more and if I did more, then God would love me more and my life would be going better. That's not what this verse means. God chooses to love us. He, is, he has chosen to love the entire world. Amen. That little verse found in John chapter 3, verse number 16, for God so loved the world. Don't miss it, don't forget it, and don't let your mind or the devil tell you otherwise. If he loves the world, then how much more does he love his children? It can't mean that God doesn't love me, and it doesn't mean that I don't have a godly love in my heart. What it means is that when I have love for the world, it crowds out the love that I ought to have for God from my heart. When I begin to love the world as John describes, I have now begun to crowd out the, the place that I ought to love and have love for God. I've crowded out with love for other things. I've placed my affections on worldly things instead of God. As we look at this, the question that we have to kind of decide is, well, what does this mean? It doesn't mean I, I can't love a steak. That if I love steak, then I don't love God properly. Well, look at this passage. I don't think so. It doesn't mean I can't enjoy going to Cedar Point or can't enjoy driving a GM or a Ford or a Chevy, whatever your poison is. They all eventually break down, especially in, in Michigan. They break down faster. Does it mean I can't love that? Does it, does it mean that having an iPhone is worldly? Or do I need to make my own clothes and, and, and live like the Amish people do? Is that what this verse means? If so, some of us are in a lot of trouble. I'd like tonight, if we can, look at this verse, the context of God's Word and Scripture, because John challenges us. He says this in verse number 15, Love not the world. Often Christians treat this like a general good idea, a kind of little pat on the shoulder. Hey, you know what? You ought not do that. When I understand this passage correctly inside of what John is saying, what he is literally saying is stop loving the world. He is not saying, hey, you shouldn't do that, though he means that. He's not saying, hey, let me put your arm around you. Often in, in, this, in this book, he says little children. He uses those terms of affection. But right here, he, he becomes very forceful in his speech and in his writing. He becomes very direct, and he says, listen... I've talked to your fathers, your young men, and your children, the verses previously, and now I'm going to tell you something. Stop loving the world. John, we can be very serious right now. So let's look at the scripture, ask God's help. Ask God to help us stop loving the world. Lord, I thank you for your scripture and your word. Lord, I ask you to help us these next few moments. Lord, help our eyes to be open to your scripture and understand what it is that we would do that would displease you. Lord, may we be touched by your spirit through your word. Lord, it will bring real change in our life. Lord, help me to say those things that would be helpful and clear. Or if there's something in my notes that it shouldn't be here, Lord, I ask you would just make me skip over it. Lord, would you bind the devil and his demons and help nothing to hinder this service? In Jesus' name I ask, amen. We need to understand, first of all, why John is so anti-world. In this current day, well, you can be anti about anything you want to be except tolerance. All right, you can be anti the color blue. You can be anti water. You can be anti trees or four trees. You can't be anti tolerant. And, and you can be anti this, anti that, anti vaccinations, anti Santa Claus, anti cars, anti power. And John is anti world. You say, well, why is John anti world? Well, the, the Bible actually defines the world force and what John means. He doesn't mean the grass outside and the trees. We know that because God made everything. And Psalm chapter 19 says uh, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So God made this whole thing to point us to him. So John is not here to say, listen, stop loving the trees. Stop loving your grass. 
He's here to tell us something else as we understand this. And as we look through Scripture, we see a few things about the world as we understand what the world is and what he means by this. First of all, we see that the, the world is battling. The world is opposed to the very things of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 says this, Herein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. See, the world is a battling place. It battles the things of God. The world is not here, this system that John is talking about, is not here to help us grow spiritually. It wants us to, <coughs> to be disobedient to what God wants us to do. You see, when someone is following the path of the world, they are not just uh, thinking things aren't a good idea. They want you to stop following God. All right, that's why Jesus said, don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated me first. It is anti-God, not just uh, slightly opposed to it. As we see, it's battling. The world is run by the wicked one. Ephesians 6, verse 12 says there are rulers of the darkness of this world. Run by the wicked one. Not only is this a battling place, it's a barren place. In Mark chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You say this, this world is barren. He who dies with the most toys still dies. I read a story once about a guy who got buried in his Corvette. Why? Why would you weigh something like that? It reminds me of the, of the story I heard about where there was a, a man was about to die. And he called in a Catholic priest, and he called in a Lutheran minister, and he called in a Baptist preacher. And he said, man, I'm about to die in a little bit, and, and what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to, to each give, uh, put $10,000 in my casket. And he gave each man $10,000 cash. Well, he was right a little while later, this man passed. At the funeral, the Catholic priest was there, and the Lutheran minister and the Baptist preacher were there at the funeral. And first of all, the Catholic priest walked past the casket and slipped an envelope in there and continued on. A few people later, the Lutheran minister was there at the, the casket and also slipped in an envelope and then continued on. And shortly after that, the Baptist preacher walked past the casket, put an envelope, and continued on. As it happened, as the story goes, a little while later, all three men were at a place and they were talking. And the Catholic began, he said, I have to confess something. He goes, I've done something terrible, awful, and I just have to get this off my chest. He goes, remember that man? Yeah. Remember how he asked us to put $10,000 in? Oh, yes. He goes, I didn't do it. He goes, the envelope that I put in was just filled with paper. Well, the other two men stemmed back kind of in amazement and shock and condemnation. How could you do that? But it wasn't more than a half a second until the Lutheran minister said, well, as long as we're confessing, I'll confess as well. And um, I also put in an envelope full of paper. I feel terrible. They looked at the Baptist preacher to kind of see what he would say, and he had a rather smug look on his face. He said, I don't know why you guys are confessing so much. I, I put a check in for the full amount right inside his casket. <laughs> Can't take nothing with you unless you lay it on a head. And this world is a barren place. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world, everything there is to have, every piece of property, every dollar, every vehicle, everything, and lose his own soul? Nothing. It's barren. Not only is it battling and barren, but it's blinding. It's opposed to God's salvation. 2 Corinthians, Paul tells us, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. You see, this world blinds, blinds people. It's not just, it's not just a, a slight problem. It's that they're blinded to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the one thing that can produce true change and transformation. It says that the God of this world is blinding them. That's why John is anti-world, hindering the gospel. Not only is it blinding, it's binding. Galatians chapter 4, even so we when we were children were in bondage under the elements of the world. Just ask anyone who is addicted to a substance whether they're in bondage or not. It is a binding world. 
ask the ones who are, who are bound to their debt because they keep on spending more than they make. It is a binding world. It is bondage under the elements of this world, and it is blemishing. James tells us we have to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Imagine brand new white carpet and a four-year-old after a rainstorm. Mom and dad will do everything he can to stop this four-year-old from running on that brand new white carpet. They want to keep it unspotted. I know too many Christians whose life is washed white as snow by the blood of Jesus, but are tromping on that white as snow carpet with their muddy shoes from the world. You see, the world is blemishing. See, when I have a proper view of the world, I cannot love it or do any, or any more than just live in it. There's that song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. See, my purpose is to please God, to, have, to walk with God, to further His kingdom. When I have a proper view of the world, I cannot love it because I don't want to love a place that's barren and blinding and binding and, and blemishing and battling the Savior. Or I can't love it, I, I, I just have to live in it because God has called me to be here and to be a light and salt in this world. Proper view of this world leaves me a place just to live. When this place becomes a source of my joy, I've crowded out my love for God. I'd ask you tonight, what brings the greatest joy in your life? Time with God? Coming to the house of God? Talking to the people of God? You're getting up and drinking a cup of coffee. I love coffee, don't get me wrong, I drink it about every day. Some days I skip just to show that I'm not addicted to it. <laughs> Dying if I'm lying. But I enjoy coffee. But I don't ever want to find more joy in a cup of coffee than in my Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't want to find more joy in a, in a car or a boat or my motorcycle than I do coming to church. If I do, i got a problem in my life then. If I come to this building and say, boy, I've got to come to church, it's Labor Day weekend, and my friends are up camping, and my family may be up camping, and I've got to come to church, you got a problem. Something has crowded out your love for the Father and His love for the world. That's what John is saying, stop loving the world. When it becomes a source of my joy, it crowds out my love for God. And some people, it's the almighty dollar. Almighty dollar made out of a tree. It's just paper. But boy, do people sacrifice their life for another dollar. There are Christians who sacrifice their life. They sacrifice time with their family, time with their Lord, time with their church family. For what? For time and a half. For time and a half. I remember years ago, we had a young person here at First Baptist Church, a teenager. They had a job at the glorious place called McDonald's. One night, they worked on a Wednesday night through the service. I talked to him. We were kind of close, and I talked to him. I said, hey, I said, you know, I saw you miss church working. Didn't need to work. Weren't supporting the family. They just worked. And I had to, Pastor. I was on the schedule. Pastor J.D., they called me back then. I was on the schedule. It was back then. It was, I think, uh, back then, the uh, minimum wage was about seven or seven and a quarter way back then. And so I figured out after taxes that they sacrificed time with their church family, time worshiping God, for around $21.47. Well, we'd look at that and say, well, I'd never sacrifice God for $21.47. What is your number? $200.47? What's your God worth to you? Because last time I read my Bible, my God's worth a whole lot more than any amount of money in this world because what doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? See, when I find joy, the source of my joy is here. I've crowded out my love for him. And don't forget the world and its system is completely opposite of God. It's not just a different way of thinking. It's not just an alternate, alternate thought process. It is completely opposite to God and His way and His works and my Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not just, oh, that's one option, that's one door, I'll go uh, door A or door B. It is that they are polar opposites. Loving the world or loving God are completely opposite. And John says, stop loving the world. He does one thing better for us, though. He begins to define exactly 
what that looks like. It would be nice on one level if John gave us a list. If John said, this is what love for the world looks like. If you drive a blue car, that's love for the world, but a silver car, that's love for God. And if you eat at this restaurant, that's love for God and, and this place. And if you have this amount of money, you spend this much here, this much here. It would be nice if John did that, but he did not do that. He gave us three characteristics of what a godless, world-filled life looks like. If we look at the passage here, John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, verse, 14, verse, verse, verse 15, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the first phrase here, the lust of the flesh. Or can I say it this way? That which pampers my flesh. You see, when I begin to pamper my flesh, John says that is the lust of the flesh, and that equals love for the world. Pampering my flesh equals love for my flesh, indulging my selfish wants, indulging my selfish desires, indulging my base cravings. You see, when I stay in bed and don't get up to read my Bible, I'm pampering my flesh. And John says that's love for the world, the lust of the flesh. When I get depressed and I decide to, to stress eat to feel better, that's pampering my flesh. We heard a great message from Pastor Gabe Rule Tuesday night about dealing with stress, and none of it had to do with food. It had to do with seeking his kingdom first, all right, and following his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You see, the, the world gives you lots of ways to deal with those problems, but they all involve pampering your flesh. And Pastor Rule mentioned some ways people want to deal with stress in their life. They all dealt with pampering your flesh, find some good friends and, and eat a good meal, find something to laugh about. And John says, when I pamper my flesh, that is the lust of the flesh. When I blow up at a situation, I give in to my flesh, that is pampering my flesh. I think the best way to say it, or the best way to describe it is, men, when we get hurt, we pamper our flesh years back, I cut my finger with a razor blade. I cut it. I was cutting foolishly, but like I mentioned last week, we all cut foolishly at times. I know not to cut toward my, my hand, but I did because I was in a hurry. I thought it, nothing will happen, but it did. It cut, it cut my finger. Went to the, to the uh, ready med there in Frankenmuth, and the lady at first said, she goes, we can't touch that. You need to go to the ER over at Covenant. I'd got a pretty good gouge in my finger. I have a little scar there still. I had it wrapped up, and I said, ma'am, if you don't deal with this, um, I'm just going to leave it wrapped up the rest of the day like this. She goes, well, come see. She goes, well, well, we'll see what we can do. And so I opened up the bandage I had, and it just split open. Blood's going everywhere. They gave me two shots. I'm not opposed to shots typically, but I was opposed to two shots that day. I had cut down to the bone. I could see my bone in my finger, and, and one shot they put right next to my bone in my finger. If that was all there was, I'd be okay. They gave me one more shot. Where, Pastor Howell? Right in the tip of my finger. It ought to be outlaw, outlawed. What made it worse, I felt like the lady was smiling when she did it. <laughs> Have you met these people who work at these medical facilities? Right, Mrs. Ash? You're probably one of those type of people who like to do that. They're like, oh, you need a shot. Give it in the front of his finger. That'll work. He looks like a big guy. We'll see how tough he is now. That about sent me to the ceiling right there. I tell you what, probably as bad as having three babies. <laughs> oh, that wasn't in my notes. I just kind of slipped my way in. Well, after that, it was kind of sore. Kind of sore. Went to bed that night, and as I'm laying in bed, all I felt was my throbbing finger. Have you ever had a pain like that? Something that hurts? And it's like you close your eyes, and the fingers are like every heartbeat. Thump, 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 thump. Man! kind of watching this big old bandage. I'm kind of watching it gingerly. Danielle was about two, one and a half or two at the time. She was just learning how to walk, bless her little heart. She reaches up to me and she grabs around that bandage and squeezes. I thought a shot in the front of the finger was bad. No, sir. No, ma'am. Your two-year-old or one and a half-year-old daughter squeezing the front of that, that'll send you back to the ceiling again. I grabbed that away and I begin to pamper my flesh. Too often in life, whatever God is doing, we grab it away and we pamper our flesh. 
Say, this is my, for my comfort. That, that's uncomfortable, and, and I, I don't want to do that. I can't, I can't step out in faith and give that away. I want to pamper my flesh, and, and that is the lust of the flesh. When I do what I want to do, I'm giving into the lust of my flesh, which cannot coexist with love for God. You see, our choir loft, and up here was about 60 people up here, orchestra and choir tonight. But there's still some empty seats. And I dare say there's some people out here that ought to be up there, but aren't because you're pampering your flesh. You say, I could never do that. That's, that's so nervous. I, I, I'd, be, I'd be shaken. I've sat up here for 17 years or so, a little bit less than that actually, I led songs, and I've seen a lot of knees shake right here at this, at this pulpit as your people are singing. Mine have before. Say, when was that, Pastor? I'll tell you a time. You, some of you don't. I'm glad most of you don't remember this, but years ago there was a wedding that I passed out in. It was right over there. If you want to know the whole story, ask Miss Betsy Mitchell, because right before that she goes, ha-ha, if you pass out, I won't even, like, won't even care, basically. <laughs> Say, why'd you pass out? Did you lock your knees? No, I did not lock my knees. I, stood, I think I've stood now in 15 weddings, or at that point I stood in 15 weddings. I had not locked my knees. I had leading songs at church. I'd done that before. I had not eaten enough, and my blood sugar dropped, and I passed out. All right, that's, that's, that's the, the story. That's what I found out. I was touch hypoglycemic. That next Sunday, Pastor, I was nervous up here. I'm gripping the pulpit because I'm thinking, I don't want to pass out in church. <laughs> Bad enough at a wedding. I'm thinking, boy, I didn't know what was wrong with me at that point. I thought, I'm going to drop here in church. I was nervous. My knees were shaking that day. You know, hold on, it's a big pulpit, so, you know, I can't shake it too much. But we pamper our flesh. John says when you pamper your flesh, that's love for the world. Your co-worker who needs the gospel. And you don't open your mouth, you're about to say, and you stop because you're nervous. You've pampered your flesh. You know it's time to go soul winning, and you know when the soul winning time is, and you say, well, I got some other things to do, and you pamper your flesh. That is the lust of the flesh. If I seek to satisfy what I feel like doing, I'm living for myself. And John says that's love for the world. But he doesn't stop there. I don't know about you, but I wish he'd just stop right there. That's enough for me to have to go to the altar some days, and I bet it is for you as well. Because I like myself, and the Bible says you like yourself too. But John doesn't stop there. He says not only is it the lust of the flesh, he says there is the lust of the eyes, or having no control over getting what I see or think. Now, we instantly think of David and Bathsheba. You say, well, no, oh, Pastor Howell, of course I'm not going to go out and commit adultery like David did. That was terrible. And then murder after that, that's, that is horrible, and that was horrible. But that's not all that the lust of the eyes includes. There's these little things called advertisements, or advertisements, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Advertisements, the point of which are to make you think you need something that you don't currently have. That what you currently have is not good enough. Your car may be a nice car. The tires may be nice, and, and the, the glass may work, and the headlights may work, but your car doesn't park itself. And you need a new car. Even Sprite for years commercial was obey your thirst. You should mute those commercials. You should know that any of that thing right there. <laughs> lust of the eyes. The world is filled with lust of the eyes. Every billboard you pass, some blazing advertisement. You need this. You don't have this. Call for this. New clothes, new phones, new shoes, new cars, new houses, new golf clubs, new everything. And John says the lust of the eyes is not having control over what comes in with your eyes, your cravings. See, when I have no control over what comes into my eyes or my ears, I'm giving in to the lust of my eyes. There are only two gates into your soul, the eye gate and the ear gate. There's that little song, oh, be careful, little eye, what you see. For your Father up above is watching down below. Well, be careful, little eye, what you see. Definitely includes things that we ought not look at, 
on phones or televisions. You ought to be careful what you allow into your house, into your life. And men, I hope that you're being very cautious as you use your phone. But understand, just by being in this world, just by being alive, the world is anti-Christian, is it not? It is trying to force its philosophy on you. You can turn on a perfectly uh, cooking show, a perfectly fine cooking show, and, and they have a, a lifestyle that has not pleased the Lord. And they want to promote this as, as if this is normal. I want to be careful what comes in through my eye gate. I want to control, uh, I want to control what I see. We ask our, our people who serve here not to go uh, to the movie theater. And you say, well, well why do you do that? Well, well years ago, we, we had this because that was the main place that, that people could go to see wicked things. But now we have Netflix and Prime Video, and you have Hulu, and you have YouTube TV and a whole plethora of streaming places on your phone and your house. And you ought to be careful in every situation that what comes in here pleases here. If you're allowing music that ought not to be in here, you're not pleasing Him. It'll crowd out your love for the Father. Well, what's the big deal, Pastor Howell? What's the big deal? It's love for God. That's what John says. Stop loving the world. It's one reason why we mute our commercials in our house. The other reason is I don't need to want more things. I want enough things without help from the world and TV. No, that's all of us, is it not? We all have water lists. I don't need more help with that. I don't want those things coming in, the lust of the eyes. You see, when I don't guard what I allow into my soul, I'm giving in to the lust of the eyes. One of the main reasons I don't go to the movie theater is because I don't want to give that control to the world. See, in my house, I have this cool thing called the remote control. Praise the Lord for technology. You know, I, I was, uh, I've read about this place called the Smithsonian Institute, and, and there, I'm sorry, the Smithsonian Museum, and there, if you go there, they have some things that are called TVs where you had to get up and turn a knob. Well, that's terrible. Man, right, there are museums. Now, that's, that was a long, man, that was, that was a long time ago. Some of those things were just in black and white, and now they have color. Wow. I'm just kidding, but with a remote, we can mute things, right? I can skip things. I can turn it off. I can pause and say, hey, kids, what happened just there? Kids almost roll their eyes at, uh, at mom and dad. They were disrespectful to their parents. Good, that's not the way you treat mom and dad. I can pause that. I want that control. I have to control what comes in here. And if I give that control away, that's what John says is the lust of the eyes. No control coming in here. When I find myself giving into my cravings, I'm giving in to the lust of the eyes. For some people, it may be an addictive substance. For some people, it's food. For some people, it may be impulse buying and shopping. It's the lust of the eyes. John goes from lust of the flesh to lust of the eyes. And in this diagnostic test, it's not looking too good for us. But he brings one more to the table. It's the pride of life. The thought that says, look at me, look what I can do, look at what I am, and, and you're not, boastfulness. The thought that says, life is just about me, and I'm the epicenter of your universe. And God ought to be the epicenter of my universe. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's about Him. When life is just about me, God's love is not in my heart. Think of the time people have said, well, I hear what you're saying, but I feel like I just have to fill in the blank. What they're saying is, I know what you're saying about the Bible, I know what God is saying, but what I'm thinking is more important than what God is thinking. I'm the epicenter of my universe, and I know what God wants me to do, I know what God would have me to do, but my way is is better. Lust, or the pride of life. When I want everything at home to be all about me, God's love is not in my heart. I love our kids. I talk about them often. But life does not revolve around my children at my house. It can't. 
They can't, Mom and Dad. They're not the most important. God is. God is. Tough for moms sometimes. Moms, you love your children as, as you ought to. I'd rather have you love your kids and not love your kids. That's not natural, according to Romans chapter number 1. But loving your kids is. But when it replaces love for God, it's a problem. It's a problem. My kids had the opportunity to play in a, in a travel soccer league, and they enjoy that. They knew early on that, that that will not take the place, will not take the place of church, ever. It will not take the place of church, ever. One time, a year and a half ago, so one of my boys was a little sad we missed a game. I looked back in the car and had another dad moment. I said, if I ever see any tears shed for missing a game of soccer because of church, we will cancel soccer tomorrow. I probably should have said today, but I said tomorrow. <laughs> it's not as important. This is more important than that. And mom and dad, this is more important. God is more important than anything else. We say it, but what's in your heart? We can say the right things. We can act the right way. We can write the right things. But John says, let me give you a diagnostic test. What is in your heart? Is it love for your Savior, love for the Father, love for that relationship and that fellowship? Is it love for your flesh? Is it no control over your eyes and your cravings and wants? Or is it that your whole world just revolves around you instead of me? Father. Life's not about me. It's about Jesus. Amen. Two things cannot coexist. I'm either loving God or I'm not. There's not three options. Paul says in Ephesians about Jesus that he might sanctify and cleanse us with the washing of water by the word. And James says pure religion and un defiled before God is this, and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So tonight, got any spots on your life? What's right here? You're pampering your flesh? You're giving in? Can you say, you know what? What's in my heart? Love for the Father. That's why John says, don't love the world. Love not the world. But if you do the will of the Father, you'll abide with him forever.